Thank you very much, everybody, for coming, uh, coming out tonight. Um, it is my pleasure uh, to be on stage with Manuel Castell, somebody who's been an intellectual hero to me personally since I was in college. This is a, a part of an ongoing series that we do at the Bruin Institute of uh, Salons. Uh, we typically have people who have published a recent book um, or eminences who are coming into town talking about contemporary events and trying to put them into context and help to understand. Uh, what's going on in our contemporary world around our various themes that we have at the Institute. We have four major themes that we work on here. One is the transformations of the human, which looks at the effects of AI and gene editing from a philosophical perspective. Another one looks at uh, the future of capitalism. We're also interested in questions of geopolitics and globalization. And, uh, and then also, finally, we're extremely interested, and it's really the origins of the Institute uh, almost a decade ago, in what's going on with the transformations and more recently the crises of democracy. And that's really the theme that we're gonna be talking about tonight with, uh, with uh, Dr. Castells, who's been, of course, working on this topic for more than half a century. Um, I have a page I've written about his biography and I will proceed to read that and then we can dive into things. Um, Manuel Castells is a professor of communications at the University of Southern California's Annenberg School of Communications where in 2003 he was appointed the first Wallace Annenberg Endowed Chair of Communications and Technology. One of the world's leading sociologists, his long and illustrious career has taken him around the world, lecturing at over 300 academic and professional institutions and in more than 40 countries. He was born in Albacete, Spain in 1942, but he grew up mostly in Barcelona and studied law and economics at the University of Barcelona in the late 1950s and early 1960s. He's from a conservative family, but Castells, like many a good young cattle un before him, began as a teenager to evolve from conservatism towards anarchism. I told you not to use <laughs> <laughs> it because it's wrong. Um, in any event, he, uh, he uh, departed Spain and uh, went to Paris, um, where he uh, studied uh, uh, at the University of Paris um, law and economics. Um, and he went on to obtain his PhD in sociology from the University of Paris in 1967. Uh, he also holds a doctorate uh, d'état in the human sciences from the Sorbonne and a doctorate in sociology from the University of Madrid. Uh, at the age of 25 in 1967, uh, Castells started his academic career at the University of Paris X Nanterre, um, uh, where he uh, also became involved later in that same academic year in some of the événements of uh, May 1968. Um, and from there he moved on, uh, perhaps semi-voluntarily, um, to the Ecole des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales, where he spent a decade emerging as one of the groundbreaking, as a groundbreaking empirical researcher and one of the intellectual founders of what uh, became known as the New Urban Sociology. His main publications in that field were The City and the Grassroots, a comparative study of urban social movements and community organizations uh, based on his field work in France, Spain, Latin America, and California. Uh, the Informational City Followed, which was an analysis of urban and regional changes, uh, brought about by information technology and economic restructuring in the United States. This brought him in 1979 to UC Berkeley, which appointed him a professor of sociology as well as city and regional planning. From that perch uh, near what would become known as Silicon Valley, Castells undertook a study of the economic and social transformations associated with the IT revolution. While his focus was on, was, uh, on the epicenter of that revolution in the Bay Area, he deliberately engaged in cross-cultural uh, in a, in a cross-cultural approach to his subject by researching as well how similar technology innovations were affecting Europe, Latin America, and Asia for the next 15 years. The results of this book was his really epic-making trilogy, The Information Age, um, Economy, Society, and Culture, which coined the concept of the network society in contrast to the hierarchy and bureaucracy-driven forms of social organization that had characterized the high modernist period of the middle of the 20th century. Uh, one of his most important recent books uh, was 2009's Communications Power, uh, which explored the role of communications and social media in shaping the responses to political change and financial crisis. And he, in that book, he drew on examples ranging from the Arab Spring to Occupy. Um, constant throughout Castell's career has been an abiding commitment to taking an empirical cross-cultural approach to studying the relationships between economic transformation, information technology, social movements, and the politics that, these, uh, that come at the confluence of these things an approach um, reflected in his latest book, Rupture, um, about the crises engulfing contemporary democracies, which we'll be discussing tonight. Castells has published more than 30 books, he told me 32, in fact, as well as hundreds of academic and popular articles. Among his many distinctions and awards, 
He was appointed to the European Academy in 1994. Uh, he was a member of the European Commission's high-level expert group on uh, the Information Society uh, from 1995-1997. Since 2008, he's been a member of the governing board of the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. And in 2012, he was awarded the Holberg International Memorial Prize, which the government of Norway designates to honor outstanding scholars in the arts, humanities, social sciences, law, and theology. He's been an advisor to UNESCO, the International Labor Office, the United Nations Development Program, USAID, the European Commission, the, governor, the government of Chile under Allende, as well as the governments of Mexico, France, Ecuador, China, Russia, Brazil, Portugal, and Spain. Uh, we at the Institute are proud to call Manuel Castells a friend. I think, in fact, I wouldn't need it, but uh, we have to. I, no, I need it only because they have to record. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm used to talk like this. Anyway, thank you. Uh, so uh, let me uh, sincerely uh, express my gratitude to the Institute, and particularly to Niels and Nathan Gardell here, for their invitation to uh, share some of my research findings and ideas with you tonight. I'm very honored by your presence here, and I hope that some interesting exchange will follow. Um, Niels uh, asked me to very briefly give some snapshots about what the book is about. Uh, and then we will engage in a broader, much broader conversation, in which I would be glad to take on any questions uh, or comments or comments that Niels, and you may have. Um, one word about the book. Uh, I have been working uh, for years on the topic, as Niels said. Uh, and then, usually it takes a long time to then, when I have enough, then I, I, I produce a book to synthesize different matters. But this book is different, because my friends in Europe, and particularly in Spain, uh, they asked me uh, two years ago that please write a book quickly uh, about what's happening with Trump, with Brexit, with all these things that you know, that you have been studying. And please write it in Spanish so that we don't have to, to wait one century until we read it uh, from your translation in English. And that, so th this book, in fact, is the first book of my 32 books that I uh, wrote originally in Spanish. Uh, I wrote eight books in French, uh, 23 in English, and then finally one in Spanish. I'm very proud of it. Uh, but just in case, I revised carefully uh, the translation, which is actually a good translation by Polity Press, which is at this point the largest social science press in the world. Um, so I think you can trust uh, that book. Second, this book is, in terms of talking about the book, uh, it's a novelty in my strategy. Uh, I decided that I have lots of things to say, but particularly I always, I always had been working with data and tons of data that I collect in many different ways. And I try to tell Niels, uh, uh, remember, I'm not a philosopher. I'm not even a theorist. I'm an empirical sociologist that, of course, tries to understand what the data mean which is a different thing. That's the scientific attitude, I hope. Um, and therefore, I was uh, bringing in my books tons of data. So much that my, the average size of my book is 500 pages. Um, so I decided to stop contributing to the deforestation of the planet um, <laughs> and started a, a, new, uh, a new strategy of publication, which I will continue in the future, which is I have the book and then I built a whole set of data in the web. And there is a URL in the book from where you can access freely and everything that you want to check, be interested, et cetera, et cetera. There are tons of data, but in the web, uh, quietly. So the book is small, but the work behind the book is not. But has, doesn't occupy space, but cyberspace. Um, the key idea. The, fun the foundational idea of the book is that democracy, as any political system or institution, only lives 
is it lives in the minds of the people. That's the fundamental point. And uh, I start from what I already uh, exactly in 98, as you said, I started that over time, uh, with the model that we uh, consider the model of democracy, I would say, I would agree with that, the model of liberal democracy, um, over two thirds of citizens of different countries in the world um, do not believe that they are governed democratically, and including the United States and Western Europe. Uh, on average, and then of course there is variation. In fact, many countries is about three quarters, and this has been increasing systematically in the last 10 years. People don't believe in their politicians, don't believe in their political parties, don't believe in their governance institutions, don't believe in their parliaments, I mean, in majority. All this is statistically, of course. Um, and um, they, by the matter, they don't believe in the in financial institutions, they hate it, uh, they don't trust the media, and so on and so on. Okay, that's the basis. Now, the issue is, um, that this, in terms of the data, they are opinions, and the four feelings that are expressed to these opinions, so we can basically ignore it, and, and just people go about their lives uh, without caring about who is in power uh, too much. Yes, one, once upon a time there are elections, and then whatever is the less distasteful uh, politician or option, uh, gets a few more votes than the other, and that's how we go. What happens is that all this routine is transformed the moment in which there is some event, some crisis, in, to use the a very uh, confusing word, some crisis which um, sh shakes the normality of life. And then at that point, all these feelings all this rejection of the system come out and provoke, on the one hand, social movement, movements for social change. On the other hand, reactions of all kind, ideological, political, uh, passional reactions, outrage. That's what my, my book on the social movement is called Networks of Outrage and Hope. They're both things at the same time. And ultimately, in a second stage, uh, this affects the stability of political systems and they challenge the established political system in many different ways. From the left point of view, this was always the idea of well, one day people will revolt and then they will change and ah, except the majority of the reactions come from the extreme right. And this is not a new thing in history, unfortunately because the large uh, reaction against the devastating crisis of the 1930s, the main result was Nazism and fascism. I'm not necessarily saying this is happening exactly the same. I'm going to tell you what is happening, but something very fundamental is happening. Now, um, what, what, is, what is happening? The, the 2008 financial crisis created this outrage everywhere in the world, in which suddenly all the promises were broken. Um, the financial institutions responsible for the crisis were bailed out with taxpayers' money at the cost of um, cutting essential social services of people and creating mass unemployment. It seemed to be unfair to millions and millions of people. And precisely at the same time, this is not a linear evolution of history. Very short time afterwards, massive migration movements started to happen, disrupting also the normalcy of our societies. Among other things, in the case of Europe very clearly, linked to the uh, unjustified invasion of Iraq and Syria, etc., etc., which created a two and a half million uh, uh, refugees and that, of course, had to escape for their lives. Plus, the typical reaction every time that there is a fundamental 
distrust in the institutions, in the civility of society, the old, the old um, uh, enemies of the humanity, racism, sexism, and xenophobia come in and provide the scapegoats for all this. But this time were the scapegoats and the entire political system in almost every country came under the same attack. The result is, yes, on the one hand, some social movement challenging the establishment, but on the other hand, nationalism, ultranationalism, and ethnic politics as the potential answer challenging the political system. So in very short time, um, everything has started to change. I, st I studied in sequence in different books the financial crisis, the origins and consequences of the financial crisis, then the internet-based social movements, and finally, the decline of traditional political systems. In the United States, uh, through Trump as a nationalist movement, and remember, was a movement against Republicans and Democrats. Against Republicans and Democrats. Uh, that all the traditional political elites of the United States were challenged by Trump. First, eliminated all the Republican leaders and then the Democrats. So, yes, because of the institutional system in America went through the Republican Party, but he's not a Republican. That's exactly the problem that the Republican Party has, uh, that they would not like to keep him in the party, but it's all they have as party. Um, so, uh, the US, Trump, Brexit, uh, in the UK, which started the disintegration of the European Union, which is now in full fledged, and we can say something about, about the matter, because w there are two ways of disintegrating the European Union. One is um, leaving, okay? One is Brexit, and Frankxit, and Italy. But the other, which is what really is happening, no, countries stay, let's say Italy, Hungary, Poland, uh, Czech Republic, etc., stay, but they decide they will not abide by any rules from the European Union. Uh, res restoration of sovereignty of the nation state as it was. Reversing, therefore, the movement of European unification. That's the new form of deep crisis of the European Union. In terms of the political system, after Brexit, France, uh, Macron was uh, not the cause of the crisis. But what happened in France was also the disintegration of the entire political system. All the traditional parties disappeared, bye-bye, except the one strong party left, the um, neo-fascist or neo or ultra-nationalist party, Le Pen, the National Front, Rassemblement National in, in this moment, with 21% of the vote, solid. And what happened is that as reaction to avoid that uh, the Le Pen party would control politics, all the other democratic remnants, not parties, parties were gone, found a way to coalesce, <coughs> to coalesce around um, Macron, at his not. But the way to understand why this is not, as it was thought, the consolidation of a new democratic France um, it starts by the observation I made in my book, it's a whole section about Macron and, and France, um, looking at the actual social basis of Macron, it's very small. Usually when I try to see in, in electoral terms what is the support or lack of support for any option, I don't look at the percentage of votes, that's misleading. I look at the percentage of people and looking at the percentage of people, because in France, particularly in the second, uh, in, the, in the elections, the legislative election in France, 49% of people didn't vote. Uh, so looking at the percentage of people, only 17% voted for Macron. So what? Macron is in Paris, he's, a, he's an intelligent guy, a good democratic conviction, etc. But with such a small social basis, down the line, and I wrote that in my book, clearly was not sustainable to confront all these problems. Result, le gilet jaune, uh, a very powerful transverse, ideologically transversal movement which has questioned deeply the legitimacy of Macron. What has been the reaction of Macron? 
go from town to town in France trying to talk to the people. It used to be, it used to be called populist. When he has to do that, it's because he's desperate about the lack of institutions. So my point is, France also, the institutions were blown up. And we can go on and on. Spain, for those who are interested, had completely transformed, what, uh, entire political system was completely transformed. Uh, by the way, one little indication, because I don't want to talk too much about Spain, but there used to be the leading conservative party controlling the country for many years, the so-called uh, Popular Party. A according to the last poll yesterday, is the fourth party in Spain at this point. Uh, among other things, because it's a new neo-Frankist party uh, arguing for the return to something like the Franco dictatorship, which of course has siphoned many of the votes of the Conservative Party. Italy, Italy being uh, governed currently by a coalition between a party that is explicitly fascist, explicitly neo-fascist, um, by the Lega North, that now is Lega, led by Matteo Salvini, with a very complicated and confusing populist movement, uh, the Movimento Cinque Stelle, that has been, in fact, now instrumentalized by the Lega and follows more or less what the Lega does. And Hungary, uh, explicitly racist, xenophobic, and anti-European. Poland, explicitly anti-European Union. And then the Netherlands with a powerful xenophobic movement. And remember the wonderful Scandinavian democracies. That was always our hope. Well, of the four Scandinavian, big Scandinavian democracies, three of them, the government is a coalition with a major xenophobic party. In theory. Only Sweden is surviving, not that they don't have a strong xenophobic party, but it's the only country with all the other parties, right and left, have decided to make a coalition against that particular xenophobic party. If we would look around the world, which is not in the book, uh, we would see very similar trends of ultra-nationalists everywhere and uh, crisis of the traditional liberal democracy in almost all major countries, let alone Africa. South Africa is in a tremendous crisis of legitimacy that is destabilizing the system completely. Latin America, I will not go into the details, but the most important thing, of course, is the election by a large majority in Brazil, the decisive country of Latin America, of an ex-military uh, person who argues for the return to the Brazilian dictatorship and to the military dictatorship. Enough. Well, uh, let me just uh, end my introduction with <laughs> very quickly the saying what is common, because that's the important thing, what is common to Trump, Brexit, and the crisis of the European Union. One, in all cases, rejection of established parties and leaders and rejections of the political establishment in general. Second, anti-globalization which in the case of Europe is anti-European Union because it's the expression in Europe of the globalization. Third, the core vote in all cases, the core, not the only, but the core is working class, farmers, and rural areas and depressed regions opposing the metropolitan elites. All this is empirical. Fourth, xenophobia. Fifth, men voting much more than women, and in some cases, like now in Italy and Spain, explicitly voting against women's rights as one of the key elements. In the United States, just to give you a, a, one element of the empirical analysis, remember that there is something specific in all this overview. The United States is the only country in which the most important variable, statistically speaking, to support Trump and what it represents is race. Race, which was not the case in Brexit, uh, which is not the case in the European Union. Brexit, the European Union, is xenophobia, which is very different. In the case of the United States, is race. This is the key variable. Uh, 70 years after the publication of Mirdal's Ameri the American Dilemma, 
we are still there. White college educated um, uh, people joined the working class voting for Trump on the basis of race. Trump won the white vote by 21 percentage points. Obama also lost the white vote, but by 12 percentage points, as he would luck. Something happened in between. Hillary's support basis, white, college-educated women, right? 49 percent voted for Trump. 45% for Hillary. And of course, if they were low educated, meaning non college, white women, then they voted 58% for Trump. The white vote was overwhelmingly for Trump. And then there are all the other elements. Okay? But I wanted to insist in that peculiarity of the, um, the American situation. So my point, methodologically speaking, is if very similar phenomena happen more, almost simultaneously in many different countries, across cultures and levels of development, something structural is going on. And that structural thing is the collapse of trust in everything and therefore different expressions, different institutions in different countries. That's why I conclude, and don't worry, with a three lines poem in my book from the great Mexican poet Octavio Paz. And it says like this Not what it could have been, it is what it was. And what it was is dead. Thank you. Thank, thank you. So uh, this was cheerful, um, <laughs> but I want to make it even more cheerful because um, it seems to me that obviously the empirical story you tell about the crisis, the institutional crisis, the legitimacy crisis in all of these Western countries, as well as you mentioned several countries in the global south like Brazil, um, you could have added easily India or the Philippines <laughs> to the list. But there are some countries where this crisis has not actually uh, this crisis of legitimacy has not been quite as severe. Now, they're not necessarily democracies. You want to talk a little bit about Russia and China? Absolutely. You are totally right. Um, I'm, talking about the, I'm talking about the crisis of liberal democracy. Not the crisis of legitimacy of liberal democracy. And a, an additional proof of that is precisely, as you said, Russia and China are the two countries that, by and large, enjoy the support of the majority of their citizens. And there is no substantial distrust in the population at large about their leaders on the basis of what? Nationalism, the fundamental thing. And they don't care about the so-called liberal democracy, which, by the way, calling, uh, my wife is Russian, calling a Democrat someone in Russia is an insult. Okay? So, yes, you are absolutely right, and that is an addition. The not all political systems are collapsing. Liberally democratic political systems. So, um, one of the themes that you have in the book, and you reiterated it just now in your summary of, of the argument, is that um, one of the things that binds together all of the constituencies that are supporting the anti-systemic or the anti-institutional uh, anti revolt are people who feel left behind. Um, that's a term that comes, I think, four or five times in the book, and you refer to it in different countries. Um, can you unpack a little bit more about, they feel left behind by what? Because it's not everyone, and I'll just give an example. One of the big debates about Brexit was that there were many people who live, you know, older people who live in small towns outside of London who feel as if, you know, the way the system has evolved has left them behind. But of course, there's many young people in Britain who feel the system has done them very well. They got a good education, they can go live and work anywhere on the continent, and so on and so forth. So talk to me a little bit more about the way in which the rhetoric, as well as the reality of left behind. Were they actually left behind? By what? And how much of this is rhetoric as opposed to reality? Well, first of all, you are right. I 
the expression of left behind, I took it mainly from Brexit, uh, although it was also used in the Trump campaign. And this is basically the idea that it's not a general economic social crisis for everybody. On the contrary, the, what they call in both places the cosmopolitan elites that happen to be in the core of the largest metropolitan areas are doing better than ever. Greater education, finance, they know how to manage the, the, this, and they are all citizens of the world. And the majority of the population in all the countries say, we are not citizens of the world. We don't like this world that you have brought to us. Uh, and therefore, there is an anti-elite. Just one example. Hillary actually want in the United States the largest share of vote in the largest metropolitan areas. But Trump won 75% and plus of the vote in all the rural counties across America. Sorry, white rural counties across America. So that did not never compensate. Hillary won Detroit, but lost all the small towns and rural counties in Michigan, and so on and so on. So the left behind are the people who could not be lifted by the um, wave of globalization and technological transformation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Plus, there is something else, which is cultural, which is about identity. Is what they felt everywhere in terms of the humiliation of by the metropolitan elites who consider them brutes, barbarians, or to use Hillary's word, deplorables. That was directly right to the emotions, as my friend Damasio would say. That was really important. That was not just class interest. was being humiliated. And that has been a fundamental ingredient of all these reactions. So people, are, so people feel left behind and they empirically have not benefited from the um, processes that we've seen unfolding in the last 40 years with globalization. They also feel humiliated because the elites that have done well by this um, system have uh, disdained them. And then the third factor is that the system then exploded and the elites who built it were not really held accountable. It sounds like you're quite sympathetic to the critique that these folks have of the technocratic liberal order that they are, you know, I am against. not sympathetic or antithetic. I am neutral. I am an observer, I am an analyst, and I cannot afford at this point as an analyst, not as a person. As a person, I go and I poke in the eye of all these guys. But uh, <laughs> I am not a pacifist in that sense. But uh, in as an analyst, I cannot take position because then I don't understand. So uh, I appreciate the attempt at scientific neutrality on this. Let me ask a different question, which maybe also will violate some sense of scientific uh, neutrality, to prognosticate a little bit and try to imagine where this is all going. Um, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr often used to argue that there can be no justice without order. Um, and furthermore, that order requires institutions and civilization requires repression. And it may rep require repression precisely of the kinds of emotions that you've been talking about. Um, do you believe that we can have a system that sort of caters to and um, enables these folks that will actually produce outcomes um, that uh, establish political, you know, establish reciprocal ob obligations that are peaceful? Or does this sort of inevitably tend us down towards a line where those with a will to power, including personalist politics, um, or maybe gangs and tribes or whatnot, are going to be the inevitable victors of this process? My friend, we have talked about this, and, and you, and you know, know exactly what I was going to answer, um, is uh, I, my, my general habit is to infuriate people around the world by showing the problems and never proposing solutions. Um, f first, because solutions are different for every society, every country, every situation. Second, because if I may uh, compare, could make a comparison with something which I'm not, it's not what I do, but I know almost all my friends are in that um, situation, psychoanalysis. Um, 
psychanalyst never will tell you what to do. That would be a bad psychanalyst. Uh, will show you all your contradictions, your problems, and say, so should I kill my wife? Should I kill my husband or not? It's your problem. Uh, <laughs> just don't get too much in trouble, uh, <laughs> but it's your problem. So I'm not saying that it's not my problem as a citizen, but it's certainly not my problem as an analyst. So in fact, you have a wonderful team at the Institute on the future of democracy. And we're gonna have, they, this, all, we're gonna have this all solved in a year. Yeah, they will, they will tell you exactly what to do and what could be. Um, maybe that's a good segue to opening up the, uh, opening up the, uh, that would be, yeah. the conversations. <laughs> and I wanna start with Nathan Gardell, our co-founder here at the Institute, who has in fact written a book that addresses exactly these issues. Um, you were at uh, Nanterre University in 1968. So even seven, yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. In, in yeah, that right. period. Yeah, you're right. And there was also a big rupture, a social mm -hmm. rupture. How do you compare that? And after that, de Gaulle came back to power with a landslide. Well, he was in power, but he got another election. How do you compare that movement, anti-establishment, anti-elite movement, those days to the Yellow Jackets today? Well, first of all, there was a movement, and a very powerful movement, but there was not a systemic crisis of political representation. And the, the movement was very influential and powerful movement in the production of cultural values, of new cultural values, not dissimilar to some of the American campuses movement. People don't know uh, that the first action of that movement that prompted police repression and then they followed was the assault to the Vietnamese, South Vietnamese consulate in Paris. That's how the movement started. Um, and there was the movement in which the feminist values for the first time were at the forefront, the environmental values, solidarity against the, uh, with the third world, um, peace, but was completely separate from the trade union, from the traditional left. So in that sense, yes, it was a movement external to the existing establishment, but not a movement that was supported by a large segment of the population. It was a cultural movement, and it produced all kinds of ideas that later on were taken by society. What we are seeing here is different, is that people vote in large uh, numbers, and in many cases in majority, against, I mean, everybody uh, across class and across genders, etc., voting against the established political style. So one thing is the social movements, another thing is the uh, outrage and anti-establishment mobilization. Antonio? So, Manuel, first, congratulations is a perfect synthesis of the situation as far as I can see. And by the way, the book is terrific. Uh, I, it's, I, it's quite, as you say, quite different from your previous books. You are my teacher, so that's big for me. Uh, uh, now, uh, one, one thing that is very interesting, I, I was listening to your, and it's not the first time that I listen to this analysis, which I perfectly agree with, but I agree with it more today than I did at the beginning, because there's something that you omitted in your story, of which you are, by the way, a specialist, which is networks, communication. And uh, my question to you is this. Is it likely that the, the, this movement, which is clearly international with the exception exactly of the, the big dictatorships, would have evolved so fast in, in, in this sort of wildfire nature if we did not have Facebook and Twitter? because my suspicion is that it would not. And I think that Facebook and Twitter were influenced by the movement, and then they contributed tremendously to the acceleration. But you're the specialist, so you tell us. You're absolutely right. And, and thanks for, you know, I deliberately omitted this in my presentation, it's not omitted in the book, uh, to simplify the argument and precisely hoping that someone <laughs> will raise the question. Uh, very, very quickly, all processes of social change throughout history, and this is no exception, had been based on communication. Because it's the only way in which people who don't know each other, who are not in a party, 
or so people who are against the existing order of things and not necessarily for a party or for anything, the only way, the non-organized way to organize yourself is through communication from throughout history. Now, the, the issue is now we have a very special kind of communication in the social networks, uh, which are not controlled by the government and, and are not controlled by uh, business. They are controlled, the channels are controlled. I mean, the mammoths of Google and, 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 and Facebook, etc. Yes, but they are interested mainly in having traffic going because that's their business. Data, not money. Our data, and that's data capitalism, that's what they do. So, uh, in terms of the actual control of the content, is very, very small. Uh, and therefore, the people had been able to organize horizontally. Now, which people? Everybody. And therefore, you have social movements, like Occupy in the United States, in Nick Nathanson, in, in Spain, etc. But you also have uh, movements of outrage, anti-establishment, uh, led by the ultra-right. And be, why? Because when people say, well, the internet is wonderful because it's free communication, and therefore it's democracy. Yes, except that the human nature, as you know well, better than anyone, uh, is very diverse. And, and we are wonderful, uh, blue-eyed people ready to change the world like angels, and then there are all, all our demons at the same time. And the internet is full of what is full society, of racist, xenophobic, fascist, violent, anti-women, misogyne, homophobic, etc. And all this goes into the internet. And therefore, ultra-nationalism and ultra-right goes into the internet. With something very fundamental has happened in the last 10 years. The mass media that used to be the space of politics is gone. The space of politics is not, not in the media, it's in the social networks. The battles have to be won or lost in the social networks. So in that sense, it's absolutely fundamental. And just one more thing, you need to comment on this. When you describe the, the Trump election, uh, you, you, you assume that it's really a legitimate election. And I think there are serious questions to place there. In other words, I, I, I don't think it, it denies your argument. It's quite likely that he would have won anyway if, in fact, this, all these factors are at play. But there is a, this other factor that was at play here for sure, and now it's becoming more and more obvious, and is also at play in Europe, quite, quite clearly in Italy. For example, in Italy, the, the southern part of Italy, is not, they, they have control of social networks by Russian uh, uh, influence. But, well, so that, please comment on that. Yeah, sure, that's very important. Well, first, of course, uh, Trump election is a legitimate election in non-legitimate institutions. Why non-legitimate? Because remember the principle of democracy, all from Montesquieu, etc., that was one person on vote? There's no one single liberal democracy which this works. Not one person on vote. is according to the system and according to the manipulation by different political parties, some votes count, some others count much less. And particularly the rural vote always counts more. And, and we could go on and on and on in this. So the, Democracies are not transparent, are structurally manipulated so that it's not one person, one vote. It's whoever wants to vote depending on who wants to give the, the to structure the law. So that's one thing. But more to the point that what you, you said is um, that, yes, the Russian election. Well, there's a whole development in my book, as you know, about the, uh, the, the Russian influence in the election. Yes, there, there has been... Uh, substantial influence in the United States, much less in France and almost nothing in Italy. But in the United States, clearly. And has been collusion and it has been all this. And yes, WikiLeaks got the, the, the email from Hillary. Well, that partly is Hillary's problem, right? Uh, you don't go around with your Blackberry unprotected and non-encrypted uh, with uh, uh, Department of State stuff. Uh, so she offered the possibility very simply. But in any case, yes, WikiLeaks got the emails, not the KGB, WikiLeaks. 
gave it to the FSB, which is the equivalent, and they used this to negotiate with Trump, trying to influence, and they provided some information to the Democrats. That is important, is significant in terms of international relations, and in terms of where Russia stands and where Trump stands, absolutely. But did not change the course of the election, for a very simple reason. To be receptive to a message, you have to be ready for this message. We know from communication research that people largely believe what they want to believe, largely. And therefore, if people would have rejected this message, with any bots, any millions of bots that they would send the message and all with the same message, they would say no. Uh, but no, the message was amplified. But the message was there and was received because of all different causes. The election, the election could, could not be played out in this. Look, it's not because there were Russian bots, hacker bots, um, that Hillary lost by 11 points in uh, Ohio, 10 points in Michigan, 8 points in Wisconsin, 7 points in Pennsylvania. No. Uh, the bots can move some tendencies, some trends, but not completely alter in the way that we actually have observed in the election. In, and in Brexit, there also was something. But let's what? The studies that they're very good statistical studies on Brexit. The uh, studies on Brexit two years before Bre the actual vote showed exactly the same percentages for Brexit exactly the same percentages. They did not move. Um, and that's one of the reasons that all the European leaders are furious uh, against Cameron saying, guy, you, you destroyed the whole possibility because of you. you know, of course, that's an argument against democracy. Don't call a vote if, if you know that it's going, you are going to lose it. Don't call a vote. Don't let people decide, which is exactly what the European Union has been doing for many years when the constitution was rejected in referendum by Canada, said, okay, well, no, no referenda. We go into the parliaments, in which we all agree about the European Union, and we approve the treaties through the parliaments, and so on and so on. The fundamental thing is that the political establishment closed itself out from citizens and did not let them come in. And at one point, the pitfalls come. That's the point. Um, Fukuyama has written a lot about institutional decay, with this notion that it is incredibly easy to erode faith and legitimacy of institutions and almost impossible for those same institutions to rebuild that legitimacy and faith. And alive but hiding inside that concept is the possibility that we still have very far to fall before uh, being jolted into building a new edifice of democratic institutions and so on. So I guess I, want, I wanted to interrogate your intuitions as to whether you're uh, a short-term pessimist and a long-term optimist on this, or if you think that we will somehow pull out. My friend, you're my friend. I'm not an optimist or a pessimist. I'm an analyst. But I, no, I'm serious. And I drive crazy my students which keep asking me all the time. I say, well, think by yourself. Uh, From the data, I, then. Uh, so, but, re, but talking about the, the implications of, of what you say, rather than saying if I am optimist or pessimist. Um, what I do have in my book is an even more, uh, let's say, dark conclusion. We are in chaos. That is, we go country country in terms of what's happening with institutions and it's getting worse and worse and worse we are in chaos um, and my greatest fear is that out of panic we start patching up and creating whatever institutions whatever something to to say well in brazil they have decided to have a semi-dictatorship uh, and and in many other countries authoritarian solutions are coming, which is another form of undo liberal democracy. My greatest fear is that we do not reflect seriously about what's happening, and that we do not have the patience to know that when you are in chaos, 
you have to move slowly out of chaos through self-reflection, through experiments, not deciding that, okay, here is my program, uh, Fukuyama. Uh, here is my, uh, you know, one, you, you laugh about my, my attitude about um, not taking explicit position, but the reason is very simple. I am one of the few public intellectuals who doesn't build the analysis of the theory to justify what I want people to do. I'm too respectful of people at large to provide whatever I have and then open up for the public debate, the public deliberation, and see how all this filters up in a way that then would be much more solid and assume. If not, we are going to deepen the crisis. And when the Democrats, and particularly Hillary, uh, uh, start saying, all this was because of the Russians. Again, it's another scapegoat. Starting by saying, yes, the Russians did all that thing. They're bad people in that sense. Not, not the Russians, but Putin. Uh, and yes, uh, Trump is in collusion, etc. But if we just say the Russians did it, we do not realize what's going on, and that will be more catastrophic. Manuel, at the beginning of your introduction, you drew some parallels to the retreat of democracy in the 1920s and 1930s in Italy, Spain, Germany. And yet you were very hesitant to name the possibility today that we're encountering a kind of new fascism. Can you give me a reason why you don't think the, the retreat of democracy in Hungary, Poland, and many other countries, maybe even the United States, has not some parallels to that fascist rise? Because a fundamental reason, fortunately, at least in Europe, will be no war. Remember, nothing was not only a political movement, not only an authoritarian dictatorial state, but there is no war possible in Europe. That's the one thing that the European Union succeeded in creating. And that takes away a fundamental point for nationalists. It's not even possible to have a war uh, with Russia. Um, no. Uh, Putin is smart enough to know how much better he, he is actually destroying from inside the liberal democracy. He's contributing, he's not doing himself, but it's much more important that uh, all the positions of all these extreme right movements uh, remain close to what he would like to happen, that is weakening from the inside. But it's not his doing, it's our doing, that he's helping as much as he can. But in that sense, it's different. However, if by something similar you mean the possibility of strong influence of neo-fascist parties, yes, but not the monopoly of power. It's enough resilience in US and Western European democracies so that you, can, you have to play more school, skillfully even from that point of view. I, I told you my story about Manon, right, and what he's doing in Europe. Uh, when Nils wants, I will tell about that, uh, which is part of the matter. Okay, Manuel, uh, first of all, I agree that there is a deep structural uh, crisis uh, throughout governance globally. And it is, I think, <clears throat> the solvency of liberal democracy is challenged. And it's challenged by legitimacy and capacity. It doesn't have the capacity and legitimacy is challenged. Um, and I think you're right in pointing out that there is an authoritarian thread, and that thread is strong in Russia, it's strong in Brazil, it's strong in China, and it's getting there here every day is a shock. But I think globalization and the network is vitally important, but there was, I wanted to ask if you could come at the, the one facet of globalization you haven't hit, and now as you can appreciate this, because I, I know we've talked about this before, and that's deviant globalization. That's the globalization of organized crime and criminal networks, and you have a challenge from the above, uh, the plutocratic insurgency, and a challenge from below, the criminal insurgency, and they're converging, as uh, Charles Tilley once said, to 
change the nature of the state. I think we're at one of those points where the nature of the state is changing. How is the deviant globalization actually playing into these broader political movements? Thank you, John. Uh, in fact, uh, believe it or not, what I'm presenting tonight here is my light version of the crisis. Uh, because to make it really serious is exactly what you said. John has done his doctoral dissertation with me on the challenge to sovereignty by the global criminal networks, Mexican network, but many other networks, because they are networkers among themselves. I mean, it's 10% of the global GDP, to start with, just in terms of money laundering, which is equivalent to more than, than the electronic industry and automobile industry in the world together, okay, to start with. And of course, there is a penetration, total penetration of all the institutions, the entire Latin America, is taken over, including Brazil, etc. You know, just not the usual suspects: Mexico, Colombia, etc., etc. Entire countries, the state. I just finished another book on Latin America, and the most important thing I have found is the key element is the corruption of all Latin American states. I hope Lopez Obrador will do something in Mexico, uh, but he started by disbanding the presidential guard uh, that used to protect the presidents, so <laughs> I don't know how much he can do. So, but this is absolutely right. So one of the additional crisis sources of the total crisis of legitimacy in much of the world, not so much, frankly, in the United States, let's say, except Miami, um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and in Western Europe, certainly not in, in Scandinavia, etc. That's not the issue. Um, but in the majority of the world, uh, this is an issue. So the ultimate crisis of legitimacy is when you cannot call the police because they are much worse. And you know that's the case, empirically speaking. Uh, okay. So yes, so that's an additional thing, is globalization, what I call perverse globalization, which is the globalization of crime and the interpenetration of global cartels of crime among themselves and with all the state in many countries. Hi. I was hoping I could ask you to add the urban lens to all that you've said because while so many countries as you describe are experiencing these far right movements, uh, cities are continue to be, as far as I can tell, many of them, bastions of liberal democracy, where you can get a group of cities around a table from all, from every continent, and we're all gonna agree that women's rights and social exclusion and migration are the real challenges. Um, so how do you, how do these two kinds of forces interact? And I know you don't really do predictions, but so where, where's it going? Where? Well, I mean, we're, the, so that there's gonna be tension, therefore, in every country between what urban, what people who live very close to each other think and what people who live farther apart from each other think. So how, what does that say about the trends within each country and then between countries? Well, I developed years ago at the beginning of all this uh, theory, for once theory, uh, about the structural separation between the space of flows and the space of places. The space of flows is where power lives, where global capital lives, where the cosmopolitan lays live, where the, the global class lives, and they meet once a year at Davos. Uh, so the, there is an, an elite in the world, and we can see it, I have been there, and they, they are there, and they talk to each other in those terms, etc. And the large majority, the 99% of people in the world, live in their places and with no connection to this abstract wall of a space of floor that they don't know what happens there. They only know through the media. But remember, the media are business, damn it. And in spite of I, all the journalists I know, and many that I don't know, are heroic, daily heroes. Uh, because they risk their jobs, and sometimes, like in Mexico, their lives, to try to penetrate and provide some a glimpse of what was happening to people at large. But they are not enough against, remember, media are owned by, by big financial interests or by governments or by a combination of both. 
Uh, so, uh, then we still have the social networks. Aha, uh -huh. but the social networks, who believed what? And therefore, the, the separation in terms of even what is happening, plus the actual institution <clears throat> of democracy between the global and the local is a structural contradiction that is not solved. I have debated with uh, um, Habermas and with a wonderful friend of mine, Ulrich Beck, about these issues, and they keep, uh, and Ulrich at the end of his life kept saying, well, we have a global world, we need global governance. Obvious, except that nobody wants. <laughs> it's a little problem. Statistically, and, and in terms of all the service, nobody wants. Uh, the European Union was the attempt to create, still is, what I call a network state, in which there is not governance in, in fact, but there is a network of nation states that try to together look at problems of governance, and there are other forms of network state. But on the one hand, yes, in terms of the effectiveness of global management is better, but in terms of representation, this brings even at a higher level of distance the relationship between the local and the cosmopolitans. So you are absolutely right, this, this separation. And then people live in their communities, uh, love being there, create their own interests, local, regional, and in some cases national, but between the institutions, which are either global or followed a global logic, and the life, which is local, is a gap. And this gap is not being filled. So I wanted to ask you, since you've um, evoked the figure of the scientist and the neutral analyst several times tonight, whether or not your book could be subtitled The Crisis of Liberal Science. And, and through your long career, do you, do you find yourself situated differently now in the position of someone trying to say, I'm going to be empirical about this and I'm going to do my analysis and my analysis will, will change what what people are saying. So what I was interested in with the Russian hacking story was not so much um, the, the political action, but, but a side story in which, for example, um, uh, tweets about both sides in the vaccine debate were being promulgated um, by, by people outside of the United States. So both the for position and the against position in, in vaccination. What does vaccination have to do with it? Well, a actually to undermine the sense that we actually know what the science is. So that's just basically my question. Is there a crisis in liberal science as well as a crisis in liberal democracy? And how do you see those two as linked? Absolutely, you're totally right. Uh, one. You see, the moment in which you start distrusting all the institutions, at no stop, it extends also to science. Because if you feel that um, whatever is happening in, in your, with your doctors or your health system, etc., either you don't have it or you cannot trust, then you go into voodoo health. And this is something very, very important. For instance, just to give a key example in the United States, um, we have the largest um, health epidemics ever, the opioid epidemics. Remember, the opioid epidemics is not about narcos, it's about doctors writing prescription drugs for people, for the family of the people, for the friends of the people, and have created an incredible black market of prescription drugs. Well, uh, people are told, are told, don't do that. Uh, th this is going to make you drug addict, but unless you know it personally, and you know people, the, the notion is, no, 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 no. This is uh, people who are trying to block our access to what we really need. If we are in pain, because that's the thing, if we are in pain, we need some cure immediately, immediately. And I cannot believe that I'm going to be addicted. I just need, give me a pill, doctor, give me a pill. Uh, so that is a case in which, again, is not the belief in the science of preventing drug addiction, 
uh, because it's an immediate need. There is distrust in the system, and in spite of the good faith of doctors, there are some ones who are not in such good faith, which are the big pharmaceutical companies. We continue to propose quick cures for pain, which is the most important thing for people, being in pain. People are not scared of dying. They are scared of being in pain when they are very seriously ill. So this is a huge market, a huge market for opioid uh, drugs. And that, this is not the responsibility of the doctors, it's the responsibility of the pharmaceutical companies. Um, you think that, and that is where politics comes in. Uh, most of the established politicians have not dared to take on the pharmaceutical companies. We are going to see now. Uh, Elizabeth Warren is trying to do that. We'll see how much he lasts, she lasts. But th that's to follow in your line of analysis. Liberal science is being under the same threat than liberal democracy. I want to ask, I want to ask a question. Steve Bannon is doing something that might almost seem paradoxical, which is an attempt to link all of these nationalist movements to one another, when in fact they might be rivalrous to one another. But you've been doing a lot of empirical study about what exactly Bannon is up to mm -hmm. and how he's trying to overcome what might seem like a fundamental barrier to that kind of linkage. Tell us about that. Absolutely. Well, the thing is, uh, is paradoxical, but remember, uh, all the nationalists may want to unite to destroy the globalists, and therefore across nation states. And then they all agree in one thing, let be in our nation. You see, it's the, it's the paradox. Um, well, very quickly, what he, uh, he, I suggested, he suggested, and Counter suggested, is uh, one of the most scary stories. I told you I, I was giving you the light version. Um, Not anymore. <laughs> well, no, there are many other things. I mean, uh, John introduced the global criminal networks, which is already a good start. Um, well, you know that Bannon left and da, 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 because of he thinks he's a real ideologist, and then real ideologist. He's an extreme nationalist, and he is at the head of a nationalist identity movement uh, for America, and then extrapolates to the world. So, and then he was he could not stand that the crooks of Trump family, which are crooks, and he's right, uh, would spoil this beautiful idealistic movement of returning America to be the great America. So, and then he attacked them, and uh, of course he lost, not only he lost Trump, which is okay, he, he lost the Mercer family. And that's much more serious, because that meant outright bad news, etc., etc. Okay, so he decided to start all over again, went to Europe, and the moment of crisis, Brexit, he had been in touch with Brexit, with, John, <clears throat> with Johnston, etc., etc., and with the foreign minister of, of, uh, of the Brexit uh, party. So he landed uh, last, last fall, early fall, in Brussels, uh, hosted and supported logistically by the extreme right Flemish nationalist movement of Belgium, but in contact with the Netherlands. And uh, he, they provided him with some logistics. He said that he's doing all this with his personal fortune. Um, according to him, he made so much money with a signful that, so that is one thing I have not been able to, to grab exactly who is giving him the money. I have some suspicion, I will tell you. Uh, but um, I, I guess if I would really find, I will be dead. Um, so, uh, so the only way to prevent that is to tell you what I know, so you know, it's already the secret is out. And, um, the, the bottom line is that he is as a target. The target is the European Parliament elections of May 26 this year, in which he hopes to create an alliance between um, ultra-nationalist parties and extreme right parties, powerful enough to block the European Parliament and therefore any adoption of any pan-European legislation. He, if, is, yeah, is, he's right that with about one third of the seats in the parliament, is blocked. Nothing can be done. Uh, and he's winning in that sense. For that, he is following a pilgrimage from extreme right 
party, to extreme right party throughout Europe. Already, he has created a movement, a foundation. It's a foundation. Now everybody does foundations. Um, and the, move, the foundation is called The Movement. Okay? And using that, started in Brussels, then he already has obtained the explicit, explicit, I say, uh, support and membership in the foundation of uh, Matteo Salvini, the strong man of Italy, of Victor Orban, the president of Hungary, of the Le Pen party, and then on and on a number of less explicit, but in fact, contacts with everybody. The Austrian president and Austrian government, the, um, the new Spanish Frankist party, which is already also explicitly now in their movement, um, contacts with Scandinavia all over the place, and interestingly enough, um, started to have a very strong um, contact with Alice Weidel, that you don't know, but she is the leader of the alternative for Germany, the neo-Nazi party that is supposed to have about 15% of the German vote in the next parliamentary elections. But the real um, catch here is his explicit alliance with the opposition to Pope Francisco in the Vatican. He has made an alliance with um, uh, Archbishop Burke, formerly from St. Louis, who is a very powerful figure in the Vatican and the explicit leader of the opposition to liberal policies in the Catholic Church, with the Cardinal Martino, another very powerful person, uh, and they are in alliance with Banu. Which kind of alliance? A uh, few years ago, uh, an institute of the extreme right, Catholic extreme right of Europe, called Institute for Human Dignity, ah, what the name, uh, was created in Rome uh, by um, the an English staff member of the European Parliament, Ben Harnwell, who was the aide to um, Nils Diva. You don't know Nils Diva. I didn't know him either. Nils Diva is a very conservative billionaire, originally from Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka, that is also the leader of the Bow Group, which is the conservative think tank in Britain. And he has been a leading uh, Euro parliamentarian, leading Brexit in the European Parliament. And he has a lot of money, and he's Catholic. And so all these beautiful people have got together, and among other things, have obtained from the Italian government the concession of a wonderful monastery, the Monastery of Trisulti, 130 kilometers south of Rome to create, to transfer there, and there is already there, the Institute for Human Dignity, which the first activity is to create a program of training for extreme right activists and Catholic fundamentalists, 200 per year, starting uh, at the beginning of next year. Who has designed the program and the selection mechanism to bring all these people there? Steve Bannon which has made an explicit alliance with all this happy crowd. Well, at, at this point, things start getting on the edge of the thriller, the story, etc. Et, et, and I, then I, as a scientist, I am scared of that. But I cannot ignore the reality, because I don't believe in conspiracy theory, but conspiracies do exist. Well, on that note, uh, let's say thank you to uh, Manuel Castells for a wonderful presentation.